Today, salacious tabloids are obsessed with the comings and goings in royal bedrooms. Centuries ago, they'd have had more justification, as it was a question on even the most courtly lips. In the royal bedchamber, affairs of the heart and affairs of state intertwined. Simon Thurley airs the royal bedclothes in some of Britain's grandest palaces. For most people, their bedrooms are the most private rooms in their house. But for royalty, they were the battleground where the struggle between public duty and private pleasures were continually fought. Back in the 13th century, kings had to make do with what we would call shared accommodation. I'm in one of the earliest surviving royal bedrooms in England. It's in the Tower of London and was built by King Edward I in the 1290s, just as the whole concept of royal etiquette was being born. It's essentially a great bedsit. In here, the king ate, washed, did business and amused himself. And at night, of course, he slept here, surrounded by his barons and advisers. To give himself a little privacy, the king's bed would have been in a curtained enclosure. But outside that, sleeping on the floor, would have been perhaps as many as ten men, partially there for protection and partly to emphasise his importance. If the king wanted to see his queen, Eleanor of Castile, he had a drafty 100-yard walk to her lodgings on the other side of the Great Hall. We don't have any record of the etiquette used on such occasions, but it must have worked. Eleanor had nine children. Linlithgow Palace, near Edinburgh. It's a ruin now, but in the early 16th century, it was a favourite seat of King James IV. King of Scotland. Here he housed his mistresses and after his marriage to the English Princess Margaret it became her home and the birthplace of his son and heir. Linlithgow was a lot more comfortable than the Tower of London. As well as a bedchamber James IV would have had a presence chamber in which he would have received the majority of his guests. What this meant was that less people had access to his bedroom but that certainly didn't mean that the King slept alone. This is James IV's bedchamber, where the king's closest advisers would have done business with him during the day and where his chamberlain would have spent the night sleeping at the foot of his bed. The king's bedroom was on the first floor and the queen's was just above with a great stair or turnpike between them. At that time in England, the regulations stated that if the king and queen wished to sleep together, the king's chamberlain should remove himself for a short season without the door of his majesty's chamber there to wait with the pages. <laughs> Not a very satisfactory arrangement. We're now in England, at Henry VIII's palace of Hampton Court. By the reign of Henry VIII, there was a list of people who were entitled to have access into the king's bedchamber. And there was an etiquette which enabled the king to avoid them and go to bed with the queen. On pre-arranged nights, the king would sup with the queen in her apartments and then, after supper, retire to her bedchamber well away from the watchful gaze of the attendants who filled his own. For a man who had six wives and 60 palaces, it might seem extraordinary that none of Henry VIII's bedrooms survive. But here, in the Burrell Collection in Glasgow, the headboard from one of Henry VIII's beds does. It's particularly important because we know rather more about what went on in it than Henry might like. On January the 6th, 1540, Henry VIII married Anne of Cleves in the Royal Chapel at Greenwich Palace. A few hours later, Henry and his new bride retired to their bedchamber and in all probability to this very bed. It has the initials of Henry and Anne and the date, 1539. On either side are carvings which acted as a sort of Tudor fertility symbol. On one side, a saucy putto, and on the other, 
a pregnant one. But in fact, it was all in vain, for the marriage was never consummated. Despite all the carvings, the king was unable to perform. In the morning, he admitted to his matchmaker, Thomas Cromwell, As ye know, I like her before not well, but now I like much worse, for I have felt her belly and her breasts, and thereby, as I can judge, she should be no maid, which struck me so to the heart that I had neither the will nor the courage to proceed further in other matters. In the next 150 years, English monarchs adopted the French habit of doing business in their bedrooms. Here, at Hampton Court, it created the curious need for at least two bedrooms, a public and a private one. This is how Sir Christopher Wren solved the problem for King William III. This is his great bedchamber, the grandest of some four bedrooms at Hampton Court, which were available to the king on any particular night. Despite the painted ceiling, which shows a shepherd slumbering in the arms of Morpheus, the god of sleep, it's unlikely that the king would have ever slept a wink in here. In this room, the king would conduct his levee. Sitting on a chair, he'd be formally dressed, surrounded by senior courtiers. He'd then rise, pass through into his drawing room, and prepare himself to deal with the business of the day. George II's levee, which was a kind of waking up in public, was carefully staged and always rigorously observed. In the evenings, it was the same thing in reverse. The king would get undressed, again surrounded by his courtiers, and then get into his magnificent bed. When the ceremony was over, the doors closed and the lights off, the king would get out of his bed and come through into this room, his little bedchamber, where he really slept. He closed the door, draw the curtain and his body servants could come and go through this concealed jib door directly by the king's bedhead. If George II wanted to see his wife, all he had to do was slip through the jib door and cross the end of the great council chamber. George II, like his distant predecessor, Henry VIII, was forced to remove himself from his male servants and come into the queen's private apartments if he wished to spend the night with his wife. Queen Caroline and King George had none of the problems of Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves. They had 13 children, aided and abetted by a sophisticated piece of Georgian technology which has never before been filmed. Imagine the scene. The king has retired to the queen's private bedchamber. She's dismissed her ladies. And as the royal pair don't want to be disturbed, even by their closest servants, they lock themselves in. The next morning, as the sun rises over the red brick fountain court, the queen rings for her maid. But she can't get in. Surely the royal couple won't have to open the door themselves. Well, no, what actually happened was by means of this silver cord, they could raise the night locks and breakfast was served. Over the centuries since King George, the kings and queens of Britain have had to be increasingly inventive to buy themselves some privacy in an ever more public life. But that's another story. Simon Thurley and the secrets of royal bedrooms. The Tower of London and the Lithgow Palace and Hampton Court are open every day. The Borough Collection in Glasgow hopes to put Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves' bedhead on display early next year.